500 elderly people were there for the free Mother's Day dance. Determined not to miss any of the fun was Linda Pinkstone from Garden Suburb. 99 years on her feet and still enjoying the sounds of yesteryear. One dancer summed up the general mood. In our opinion, old time dancing will never fade away. It'll be here forever. The younger ones, they'll learn and uh, they'll appreciate it as well. Newcastle's Lord Mayor, John McNaughton and wife Margaret, who didn't miss the opportunity to dance to the old time favourites like the Monte Carlo Quick Step, Twilight Waltz or the Canadian Quick Step. It's been a, a great occasion and something that I hope will be done many times during the year. But how does Newcastle's Lord Mayor dance? Oh, he's wonderful, especially if we do the old time waltz. We both learned that when we made our debut. Does he step... But these people leave us for dead. They're wonderful. Does he ever step on your toes? Uh, occasionally, yes, but then I'm not so crash for hot myself, so it <laughs> doesn't make any difference. Yesterday, Metro Meats handed out dismissal notices to all but administration employees at the Gosford plant. The closure is the second already this year, after the plant was shut down for an extended maintenance period that lasted 11 weeks. One Gosford plant official said it had been hoped that the closure of the Wyong abattoir during a recent industrial dispute would bring more work to the Gosford plant, improving its viability. However, this has not been the case. The official said the constant battle with local councils over pollution from the plant was also a contributing factor and that due to the increased housing in the area, he felt it wouldn't be long before council wanted to shut down the plant. Metro Meat State Manager John Dobson says due to stock shortages and the bad weather, the plant has had to close indefinitely. He says Metro Meats has always intended to close the plant within four to five years, however that closure date may have to be brought forward. Some key employees will be offered jobs at the company's orange plant, but others are being encouraged to begin looking for other work during the closure. Union officials met with management today to ensure employees receive their full severance entitlements when they dock off next Tuesday. Darren Curtis, NBN News. Tea Gardens, a sleepy backwater with a population of around 600 people. Scenic and undisturbed, it's the perfect place to live out your retirement years. <laughs> the Tea Gardens Bowling Club has 180 playing members. For 10 years, the greens and facilities have been leased from the local RSL sub-branch. When the lease was to be renewed, the price increased from $6,000 to $19,000 a year after it was valued by a Newcastle real estate agent. It was from here that the bitterness and legal arguments began. RSL President Wal Coleman says from the proposed sale, $280,000 will go towards building a convalescent home in the area. Also, in an attempt to keep the bowlers on the greens, the RSL has asked the buyer to maintain some club facilities. Members of the bowling club fear for the future if the greens are sold. Was once the uh, the contracts are exchanged, then the, the purchaser can do with the land what he wishes and whether he continues to <coughs> provide us with the facilities to continue playing bowls or not, his option. At a meeting next Monday, a decision will be made on the club's future, a vote which may well divide this close-knit society. Peter Ryan reporting for NBN News. Grey entire Ravenstone has bright prospects of completing a hat-trick when he contests tomorrow's civic handicap at Rose Hill. 
Once again, apprentice Shane Edmonds will ride the five-year-old, and on weights he meets the second favourite, Magic Gleam, on better terms than when they last met on this track two weeks back. On that occasion, Ravenstone beat Magic Gleam by one and a half lengths. Gary's third horse in the trifecta is Thrifty Reserve. For the Daily Double at Rose Hill, try Ravenstone in the first leg and Imba in the second leg. Australasia's highest stakes winner, our Poetic Prince, will take his racetrack earnings to more than $3 million if he wins tomorrow's Rothmans 1000 at Doomben. The New Zealander was most unlucky when runner-up to Groucho in his first Brisbane start this campaign last Saturday. The likelihood of a heavy track will enhance our Poetic Prince's chances even further. And for the trifecta, with our Poetic Prince, put high regard and Bowie. For the legs of the Daily Double, Gary of course goes for the Prince, and in the second leg, Noble Clubs. Every mum gets a box of chockies at Broadmeadow tomorrow and there is transport to and from the football at the International Sports Centre. For the Daily Double, try Boxer and Apollo Ruler and in the trifecta, for 3 and 11, Boxer to beat the dentist and Silvius. The Newcastle Trotting Club are conducting their cup meeting at Cessnock tomorrow night and for the Daily Double, Gary Harley suggests Stacey Ann in the first leg and Magistrate Smith in the second and for the trifecta, Imperial Grant, Rocket Jason and Earth Station. Without a win after four matches in this year's National Basketball League, this weekend's match against the Sydney Kings is vital and coach Ken Cole didn't need any reminding of the fact. I think every game's uh, important and of course they're becoming more important as we keep driving. I, I haven't lost four games in a row in uh, 35 years in the game, so it's all new ground for me too. I hope it stops here. And will he have to change his tactics against the Kings? Well, I think we've we've really varied our tactics a lot in each game, and we've varied our lineups a lot. I think we'll go back to the lineup that's been most successful has been our bigger lineup with Michael Johnson and Jerry Everett at guard, and our young kids up front with Bill Jones. So I think we'll go that way. I think we'll go back to a real big lineup, and then try and get some consolidation early. And if we can do that, that'll give us a good chance again. In local league this weekend, all matches are set down for Sunday with South to meet Wests, Central do battle with Cessnock, Maitland are up against North Nelson Bay, Curry and Toronto clash and Lakes meet Waratah. Newcastle Australs are looking to get on the winning list and this Sunday they are away to Polonia. Austral will field import Mark Elric in his first match for the club. Six years ago, Senator Button says Newcastle was in a depressed state, but he says Newcastle has adapted well to restructuring and the community has supported the enormous change. In certain aspects, he says Tube Makers represents an Australian first. There are a few other companies in Australia who, uh, which, uh, like Tube Makers, sat down in sort of 82, 83 and said, uh, we want to compare ourselves with businesses around the rest of the world of the same type as ours and see how we compare and found that their performance was about 40% of the best plants in the world and decided that they had to change all that and their performance is now the best in the world. He says the big change follows a reduction in the workforce and productivity improvements. Tube Makers produces much the same amount of pipe and tube it did before the now ended steel plan, but with half the workforce. He says the plan has contributed to the industry's recovery, giving companies like Tube Makers and VHP confidence to invest more than $2,000 million Australia wide. Described by onlookers as a flying wing, the ultralight aircraft disintegrated in mid-air. Its large wing sections coming down near a farmhouse on the eastern side of the highway. From there, a trail of wreckage pointed to a patch of dense scrub just beyond the roadway on the western side of the highway. There, rescue workers found the body of the pilot still strapped to the seat and engine section of the aircraft. 
Teenagers Todd Wilkinson and Jason Dodd had been watching the low-flying aircraft just before the crash. I told him to come and have a look at the, um, the actual light, and actually as it was banking west, they just sort of exploded, and all ash, debris, and, and the motor kept going and landed over Falling here. Falling from the sky over near the farming, and he went this way, and the other parts went over that way, so he got put, catapulted over there. Did yeah. the wings actually come off it? Yeah, yeah, all debris and stuff yeah. went down over there and we jogged up and helped them look for the pilot. We couldn't find it, then they eventually called yeah, out. Yeah, about five minutes after here. it happened, the ambulance came over here and he, we found him just down there. Yeah. Police, firemen and rescue squad members sealed off the area surrounding the crash, searching and failing light to ensure all pieces of the scattered wreckage had been located. Police scientific officers and investigators from the Air Transport Authority are due on the scene shortly. At this stage, the identity of the pilot has not been established. The area where the plane crashed is near a field used regularly by ultralight pilots. Jim Sullivan reporting for NBN News. Residents of Macquarie Street, Merriweather met with representatives from the State Transit Authority this afternoon to air their dissatisfaction with the current bus timetable. As it stands, the elderly people of the area have to wait up to three hours for a bus to or from Newcastle. Alternatively, they can walk down a hill to the bus stop on Glebe Road, but claim that's not safe. They have a very large hill down here which they have to walk down uh, to get to a bus down on City Road and being a physiotherapist I can tell you that it's impossible for elderly people to walk down hills just as much as it is to walk up hills. Since the timetable was changed in April the residents have complained to State Transit but they claim their pleas have been ignored. We have spoken to Mr Regan on many occasions uh, by telephone um, to ask for his support in giving us back our school bus and more buses for the elderly people. Um, he has assured us that there is something being done but it appears from our meeting today that he's uh, done nothing at this stage and we haven't at this stage either received any uh, word on when we might get any buses back. Len Reagan of State Transit denies this. Castle buses, there have been other staff appointed to handle these matters and those other staff have been attending to their requests. It's not only the elderly residents who are affected. If the 18 children who live in the street caught the assigned school bus, they would arrive at St Joseph's at the junction 15 minutes late. As a result of today's meeting, the residents have been guaranteed that the school bus time will change. We're pretty sure we can find a bus at a more appropriate time for them, for the, the school children in the morning. Mr Reagan admits the street is a difficult one to service. It's a dead end and it's only 16 minutes from the city centre. Not long enough, he claims, to make the run economical. But he assured the residents that their concerns had been noted and alternative timetables will be tried. The new United Collieries mine is the result of almost eight years of talk and a $15 million investment. The mine is to be developed in three stages. The first, a small open cut mine set to produce 250 tonnes of coal in the first year. The owners are Egypt Coal Australia, White Industries and the original leaseholder, the Miners' Federation. State Minerals and Energy Minister Neil Pickard says despite 3,000 jobs being lost in the coal industry last year, he is optimistic about the new mine's future. It's looking marvellous. There's a great opportunity. World markets there for us. There are tremendous coal deposits, the best in the world. It's there for us as long as we get together, cooperate and not let selfishness stand in our way. But Mr Pickard's attitude is tempered by a more cautious white industry. Hunter Valley has the worst industrial record in the coal mining than any coal mining district in Australia. And it's, uh, the last three or four years has been an absolute uh, disgrace for both the unions and the companies involved. And uh, both of them have got to get together and start to resolve the issues that, uh, that are uh, at the moment causing strikes. And uh, basically, if the industry is to have a long-term future here in the valley, that's a key element. 
a key owner in the mine is the Miners' Federation. How will their role improve industrial relations? The Miners' Federation is a miners' union and it will continue to protect and advance the, the, uh, the interests of mine workers. Our view is that by participating in United, uh, we're making it less possible for coal owners to, uh, to pull the wool over our eyes. Reigning Premier South Newcastle went to the unbeaten run of Western Suburbs in the Newcastle Rugby League match of the day at Townsend Oval. South led 14-8 at half time, but the Rosellas got within two points nine minutes after the resumption with a smart try to Wayne Dawson after an excellent pass from Peter Webber. But three minutes later, South's Peter Parr knocked over a penalty. He did it again with three minutes left in the match and South were home by six points. At Carl Oval, it rained points and it was the Seagulls who got up by a big margin. Lakes were on the board first when veteran prop Mick Pittman was on the end of an excellent move, getting the final pass from Crow and Pittman was over. Waratah retaliated almost immediately when Alan Williams threw a huge pass to winger Darren Slocky, who beat a couple of tacklers to score in the corner. But with players like Peter Walsh able to put teammates into gaps, Lakes went on with the job to score convincingly. Essendon has continued its charge towards the VFL top five with a convincing five goal win over the Brisbane Bears. The Bombers winning 17-10-122 to the Bears 12-9-81. In the National Basketball League, the Perth Wildcats ended the fairy tale start to the season for the Melbourne Tigers, building the Tigers by 20 points. And in Newcastle last night, the Kennard Hunters got away to a flying start to their South Eastern Basketball League season with a six point win over West Sydney. New import David Immel hit 31 points. And still on basketball and over 500 junior ball players from Port Macquarie to Gosford were in Newcastle this weekend for the Northern Division Country League. And it was a chance for the selectors of the representative teams and coaches to cast an eagle eye on the talent on show. Ranging in age divisions up to under 18, games were still being played late this afternoon with Newcastle teams featuring in most finals. And in Northern New South Wales Soccer Federation matches today, Western workers were too good for Stockton and Adamstown Rosebuds defeated Belmont Swansea 1-0. The deferred Saturday race meeting at Broadmeadow will be run tomorrow and Gary Harley's tips for the meeting in the first leg of the daily double race 8, he likes number 4, Boxer. In the second leg, race 9, he likes number 1, Apollo Ruler. And the trifecta on race 8, the numbers 4, 3 and 1, Boxer, the Dentist and Silvius. The Get Skilled program is aimed at getting unemployed people under the age of 25 trained and into full-time employment. TAFE is offering a variety of 22 courses in the scheme to try and get those who have been unemployed for six months trained in industry skills that are in demand across the region. Secretary of the Department of Industrial Relations, Peter Lawson, says besides salary subsidies, Hunter companies will receive other benefits. Private sector employers will get the benefit of having a skilled and trained employee, uh, tailored skill uh, to suit the circumstances of the industry. The scheme has already attracted interest with BHP and smaller businesses like printers taking on the apprentices. And to acquaint unemployed with the scheme, letters to every person on the dole in New South Wales have been sent out advising them of their nearest TAFE college and the courses available to them. Officials hope at least half of the 38,000 who receive letters will attempt the courses. A total of 157 top-class young horses went under the auctioneer's hammer at Scone's White Park Racecourse today in what being hailed the town's most successful yearling sales ever. A traditional part of Scone Horse Week, the sales have always attracted plenty of attention among the racing fraternity, and this year was no exception, with many big-name metropolitan trainers scattered throughout the stands. 
top prize for the day went to two fillies. One by the respected Sire County and from the Wakefield studded scone went for $30,000 to Randwick trainer Bill Mitchell. The other by US Sire Yala Native and from the Sejinho studded scone was bought by the local Pine Lodge stud. The top prize colt sold for $29,000. He was by top Sire lunchtime and offered by the Beamer stud again at scone. He was bought by the Ingham family, a well-known name in the racing game. Prices this year averaged $5,200, a new record for the yearling sales. The Home Start program is the first of its type in Australia and is based on a model established in England. The scheme operates through the Hunter Institute of Higher Education and is an extension of the Hunter Caravan Project, an organisation which works with disadvantaged children in caravan parks. Home Start is a voluntary home visiting scheme offering friendship and support to families with children under five years of age. We train or prepare volunteers who are parents themselves um, to visit families who have young children and it's in their own homes. Now it's not a professional counselling service or anything like that. What we're aiming to do is to provide the support and friendship that many families with young children just don't have these days. The success of the scheme however depends on volunteers. Well anyone can be a volunteer so long as firstly that they are parents or grandparents themselves because we really encourage people who have grandchildren to apply. Um, they have to be willing to commit themselves to a preparation program and that's what we're starting to run next week. The program has received $40,000 this year from the Department of Family and Community Services. Organisers hope that financial assistance will continue as the program develops. Year four and five students from St Philip's Christian College became the first hunter children to experience the sights and sounds of the Life Centre. Using the latest teaching aids, the centre took the children on an intergalactic experience to view the complexities of the human body from a new perspective. Educators both here and on two life buses touring the region teach the youngsters firstly to respect their bodies and secondly to maintain them by rejecting drug abuse. The first tour took less than two hours, but it marked the end of a five-year journey for Life Centre Chairman Lynn Thurnham and Father Arthur Bridge. People of the Hunter contributed more than a million dollars towards the centre, but Lynn Thurnham says their support must continue. Oh, it has to continue, yes. The community have showed that they really wanted this centre. $1.3 million they pledged in the NBN Telethon in 87. And, of course, we have this wonderful structure here behind us. Uh, but, yes, we do need ongoing funding. Father Bridges' work is almost finished, but he says the community now recognises the need for life education. I think now that the community has this facility, they will rise to the occasion and they will see that every one of their children, and there are something like 100,000 young people, or if you like, about a sixth of the entire region's population, will have some association with this centre, and I think as it's their centre, they'll do something with that. Although the centre never cajoles children, it was clear even after their first visit that the youngsters were beginning to understand the message of life education. I think it was um, a good educating thing on not to use drugs. What do you think the message was? Not to use drugs and that you can say no to when they ask you. And then what about uh, your next visit? Are you looking forward to that? Yes, very much. Normally low-profile activists have gone public in a bid to remove Senator Morris from his position as honorary president, a move that is shaping up to follow the public factional fighting in the recent Transport Workers' Union ballot. State organiser for the Liquor Trades Union, Pat Reeves, who is challenging Senator Morris, claims the senator is out of touch with members. A very, very poor attendance with the union business, 20 days, 20-odd 20 days in the last two and a half or three years in the office itself. Uh, nothing's getting done and... Uh, Mr Morris seems to be fighting this campaign on uh, the penalty rate issue. I found out uh, last week that uh, 
In fact, a, a document was signed with Pizza Huts of Australia um, in February 1988, where uh, penalty rates actually were reduced from 25% part-time loading to 15%. Uh, if anybody's attacking penalty rates in this industry, Mr Morris is. Mr Reeves has taken out a Supreme Court order requiring Senator Morris to produce all bank statements and other documents relating to the union and to refrain from using any union monies. The public brawling continued with Senator Morris filing a Supreme Court action against Mr Reeves over alleged defamation of the Senator's character. Today Senator Morris was unavailable for comment. Mr Reeves says if he is elected, the entire direction of the union at the moment will be turned around. We'll get back to being an industrial union and not a political union. Union members go to the ballot box on the 7th of June and the bitterness is expected to continue until voting day.